Hi, I'm Brian Vines, and this is 112BK. Coming up, the midterms. A local reporter gives his final two cents as New Yorkers get ready to head to the polls. It's important to keep in mind all these state Senate districts are gerrymandered to keep Republicans power. Mm-hmm. So it's not going to be easy to drive them out. Um, but there's a big Democratic registration advantage over two to one. And when you have that, you have really room to, to grow. And then educational attainment, it's what's expected to lift people out of poverty. But poverty often acts as a barrier to higher ed. A new documentary explores this dynamic and the potential emergence of a new support system. We were stepping into places and like, we're here to help you with the college process and we can help you with your personal statements and all that. Just listen to us and we we have this knowledge that we're willing to provide. Just ahead, we'll speak to a Brooklyn-based filmmaker and a key protagonist in her new film about the barriers to higher ed facing many public school students right here in New York. But first, Tuesday is Election Day, in case you hadn't heard, and a lot of local races are getting outsized attention in what's being called the most important election cycle of our lifetime. To talk about the ballot in the city and his effort to be on it, we're joined by local journalist Ross Barkin. Thanks for taking some time to talk with us today. Ross, how are you? Hi, I'm good. Thanks for having me. Well, we always love to hear from you. And now you are blessed with perspective on both sides of the issue. We've talked to you for years about politics here. And now we can talk to you as a former candidate as well. You wrote a fantastic piece in Gothamist chronicling uh, what you learned from being on the other side. You want to readers digest that for just about 10 seconds? Uh, Sure. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I've been a journalist for a long time and uh, I ran for office myself this past year uh, for state senate, so definitely uh, we're hoping to be the Democratic nominee in the 22nd state senate district, which is uh, held by Republican Marty Golden. Eight-time guy, right? Eight terms in. Sorry. Eight terms in, Marty Golden. Yes, yes. Long, yeah, long time. Been there since 2003. So you know, it's entrenched in many ways, but also vulnerable. He's quite conservative and, and an increasingly. Uh, left-leaning district. Uh, so for me, you know, it was about winning, but it was also it was a very informative experience, and it really you know, showed me the other side and, and, and how you know politics really works. But it was just somewhat in the ways I imagined, but also uh, there, there are definitely key differences as well. So it was definitely a fascinating time for me. Well, what's also fascinating is that race that you are in and what's become a repeat face-off again, looking at that eight-term incumbent, is uh, going up against the same challenger that he, I guess, beat by about 10,000 votes on the last go-round here. What are you uh, seeing and hearing from the district there? Uh, It's definitely, there's a lot of energy uh, around beating Marty Golden. Uh, Democrats are, are getting fired up. It's still a tough fight to gerrymander district. It's important to keep in mind all these state Senate districts are gerrymandered to keep Republicans power. Mm-hmm. So it's not going to be easy to drive them out. Um, but there's a big Democratic registration advantage over two to one. And when you have that, you have really room to, to grow. So a blue wave you think is going to be crashing down on Staten Island and parts of Brooklyn? Uh, it's possible. I, you know, I don't want to guarantee victory. Yeah. I think these things are uncertain. You have two incumbents who, while have uh, issues, are also strong in many ways. You know, Dan Donovan it has, is a known quantity on Staten Island. Marty Golden is someone who is quite controversial but has a base of support. Yeah. So I think it's possible. It's definitely possible. Both will lose possible two votes will survive uh it, it's no guarantee either way mm-hmm. but you know it, it, it and part of that is the configuration of the districts the fact that um you know, these are areas with, with pockets of conservative voters and also uh incumbents who uh do, do run with some strength 
So what is it? I know in a second we're definitely going to get to the Donovan Rose race, but I'm wondering what do you think it's going to take to essentially dethrone Marty Golden after all these years? Um, it's going to take Democrats showing up, energizing Democrats. It's, it's a two-to-one registration method, yeah. so you can turn out your base, you'll win. You have to get to get the people out, and you have to hope they there are enough people who aren't still loyal to Marty Golden to, to stop that. Um, so it's really about motivating voters pushing them to the poll, especially younger people, uh, people who maybe haven't voted as much, getting right. them locked in. That's very important. Well, this young progressive wave has really been a headline since the primaries. And I personally have friends who are going out to do canvassing and work tomorrow on the Rose campaign. So where's the energy out there? I know there's not very much light between Dan Donovan and Max Rose at this moment from what the polls are telling us. Yeah, it's a very close race. Uh, it, it's always been close. He's, I think Donovan's a slight favorite. He's always pulled the head. Mm-hmm. Max has a very big volunteer operation. A lot of people are motivated to defeat a Republican in New York City, which yeah. has helped. Uh, you know, Max isn't running as a particularly progressive candidate. He's run more of a centrist campaign, a lot more like Connor Lamb in Pennsylvania, uh, not you know, attacking more to the center, right. uh, but still progressives are excited by the fact of of pushing a Democrat over the top, so it's really driven a lot of excitement for him. And he's raised a good deal of money. So looking at the composition of our state legislature right now and all those seats up for grabs, what do you, if you had to make a prediction, what do you see as uh, coming through there? What's going to be the headline Wednesday morning? Um, I think the state Senate, barring um, a really strong Republican performance, is going to... uh, move into democratic hands you don't have the idc anymore they they were disbanded and then six out of eight of them were defeated in primaries um so there's not that um extra help the republicans got in the past uh mm-hmm. democrats are one seat shy of the majority republicans are playing defense defense in a lot of seats and it's likely a few of them will flip and so i think that's the mo- that's that's the most likely outcome in democratic state senate um, the other other races, in particular Rose and, and Gennardis, uh, those are more in question. Uh, I, 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 I would be surprised if Democrats don't take the Senate. You never know. Mm-hmm. But that feel is increasingly likely. So looking at that composition of the state legislature, how do you think that's going to affect, if he's successful, uh, current Governor Cuomo as he tries for his third term in office? Um, it's gonna it's gonna push him to the left. They they're gonna be emboldened. Cuomo's gonna also try to tame them on certain issues. You'll definitely see uh, certain long stalled initiatives like like the Dream Act and the uh, Reproductive Health Act. Um, you know, possibly campaign finance reform. You know, better voting laws. These these things uh, the Democrats and Cuomo can agree on. There there are bigger issues at play, like a single payer health care system for New York State. Mm-hmm. Um, how strong our uh, tenant and rent laws become, you know, those will be debated probably, um, you know, aggressively between the Democrats and Cuomo. Uh, but, you know, you'll probably see a governor tacking further left uh, to accommodate uh, a new legislature. Well, one thing for sure as we expand that statewide look is that New York will indeed have its first African-American uh, person serving as the AG. Uh, is it going to be hometown hero Tish James? You think? I, Tish is very likely to win. It, 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 it's, it's incredibly difficult for Republicans to win statewide. Hard, harder even in this environment. Yeah. I would be very surprised if Tish James is not the next Attorney General. It's really hard for her race to lose. It's her race to lose. That's a good position to be in on the eve of this election. Ross Barkin, thanks so much for jumping us on the phone today, and we hope to see you back at the table here at 112 BK very soon, sir. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for having me. All right, we'll see you at the polls tomorrow. Getting good grades and having a good resume is only half the battle for high schoolers trying to get into college. Those achievements mean nothing if you can't put together a strong application. It's a process, but one that far too many students, especially if they happen to be minority or lower income, are forced to navigate virtually alone. 
a new documentary called Personal Statement, which recently had its New York City premiere, explores the fraught landscape for three New York City students trying to compete for scholarships and acceptance into four-year colleges. Here's some perspective. The national ratio of school counselors to students is one to 490. That's the average, and it's far worse in under-resourced schools like many public schools in this city. To tell us more, we're joined by filmmaker Julie Dresner. Welcome to 112BK. Thank you so much. And one of the subjects of the film, college student Enoch Jimmett. Thanks for coming to the show. Thank you so much. And I guess I should have Happy said spoiler alert before that because it's all about the process, but you are in fact a college student yes, now. I Congratulations, am. sir. I'm loving the life, thank you. So Julie, we're gonna start with you as the filmmaker. How did you get interested in this subject? We heard a startling number, but to hear a number is one thing, to devote a few years of your life and find some extraordinary people to follow is quite another. Yeah, well, you know, College access is one of the most important civil rights issues of our time. In our country, 95% of all high school students have college aspirations. And yet, only 16% of low-income students in the country are actually getting a college degree. Mm -hmm. And you know, while there is dialogue yeah. and people are talking about the achievement gap, mm -hmm. oftentimes people are not focused on one of the core causes of the achievement gap, which is that most public schools do not have a single college counselor. Instead, school counselors are asked to take on the role of helping students navigate the college process, the financial aid process, right. which is increasingly complicated. College is more expensive than it's ever been. Yeah, mm -hmm. And young people are having to make some of the most difficult and important decisions of their lives as they figure out how to get to college, how they'll pay for it, where to go, how much debt to take on. Mm -hmm. And many are, are doing this with, as you, as you explained before, little to no help because these school counselors that, you know, the average ratio around the country, and again, it's not a New York City problem, this is a national issue, right. is one to, you know, 490. And those school counselors say that they can spend an average of 22% of their time on college counseling. So. Wow. I came to this issue and decided to make this film because I wanted to shed light on this issue and help, you know, we're hoping that the film will build support mm -hmm. for more uh, college and sure. career counseling mm -hmm. um, in public schools. And I was inspired by the work that Enoch and his peers were doing. They had decided to take it upon themselves to fill the college guidance gap in their schools. They stepped up and they're working as college counselors in their high schools not just focusing on themselves, yeah. but first and foremost, they were helping every single one of their classmates right. with the college process. Can I quote a genius guy I saw in the film? He said, it's sad because we got to go through the struggle for someone else to learn. I think that was your quote, actually. That is me right there. So you were going through this process, mm -hmm. largely self-guided, and reaching back and pulling people forward while you're trying to find a way out yourself. Mm -hmm. And... It, it was it was an intense process and just going through like the whole care program and like the things that we learned me and Andrew and like the uh, one of our other students were we're going through it and we're like yo we don't know any of this stuff like and we're about to go to college and I'm sure our peers don't know it either you know like we were sure that of that so that's like I guess where our passion grew the fact that we were just I guess ignorant in the whole process so where would what would it have meant for you as like a ninth grader 10th grader 11th grader even to have someone like you to step into the room and say look here's a road map mm -hmm. I, me if I had if I saw me like thinking about it in their perspective I yeah. think I'd be like all right like I know college is very important and then I think I would have to be hit with the facts that I what I don't know like this is what you guys don't know, and look at how difficult this is. And then it would have like I would have been super, super interested, like oh my goodness. But we were stepping into places and like we're here to help you with the college process, and we can help you with your personal statements and all that. Just listen to us, and we we have these this knowledge that we're willing to provide. Knowledge in air quotes for people who are listening on the podcast. Why air quotes with the knowledge? Because I'm sure they're they're like thinking like who are these people? Like right. what do they know that I don't know? Type of stuff, you know. Yeah. So it's. I guess it's a weird role to fill to be like someone's 
guidance or co- college guidance counselor. So it was something for me to be watching it because there were points where I stopped watching and said, these are students. Mm-hmm. They're doing the job that we are failing to do and to afford them with folks. And I'm watching them in their family lives. I'm mm-hmm. watching them. Some are working. Some are going to school, practice, doing all sorts of things. And on top of writing your own statements, mm-hmm. you are trying to get people just aware of what it takes. So mm-hmm. you being there, how do you go to work every day knowing that the system is completely broken and they're fixing it from within? Well, what do you mean? What's your question about just what it takes to get into the mental space to make this film and see day in and day out. Mm -hmm. This is wrong. I shouldn't even be here. Like this should not be the subject of a film, but people are doing brilliant things and you're there observing it saying like, how do I use my power, my voice, my privilege to put them out of business? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, well, it was a privilege to be able to spend their senior year with them, uh, watching the work that they were doing. You know, I think part of the reason why uh, College Access Research and Action, the organization that trained them to work as college counselors, was so welcoming and the and the schools that were supporting them were so welcoming to, a, you know, us coming in with a camera yeah. and filming was because when people hear that young people are doing this work, they don't actually believe that they can do it including city council member uh who's from right here well brad lander he does he has seen it in action what 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 the point i'm trying to make is that you have to see it in action to believe it and to understand how powerful they are and how effective they are and what i saw by being alongside them with the camera and what you can now see in the film is that they are able to first of all do some things that adult college counselors can't do, but they can do many of the things that college counselors are often the ones who are doing. Mm -hmm. And their patience and just being alongside and being supportive, they were able to have a real impact on their peers. And what we're hoping is that through the film, Mm -hmm. they'll be able to reach many more young people. And that is what we've seen. We've been screening the film. We've been on a festival circuit. Mm -hmm. We've been doing uh, other kinds of screenings in schools. And what we find is that students are really moved. We've heard students who have said things like, you know, I'm I'm in the middle of this struggle. There, you know, every day I'm I'm thinking like maybe I should just give up because Mm. this is just too difficult. But I have I've now watched these three young people. I see myself in their stories and I'm now recommitting to doing this because they had barriers. They overcame them. And I can, too. Well, speaking of the film, we're going to give folks an opportunity to see just what we're talking about. You want to set up this clip that we're going to see? Sure. So the uh, clip that we're going to see now is of Enoch and his fellow uh, youth leader, Andrew Greenway. They are doing a workshop in a class for juniors Mm -hmm. on how to write a personal statement. I wrote about how every time I'd come home from school in middle school, um, my mom wouldn't be there. I would be mad at God, you know? Like, why would God not have my mom home and not, like, take care of me? So I'm, like, going crazy. I used to call the cops, and they'd stay with me until my mom came home. And it just kept happening. And as time went on, I just realized, like, maybe maybe I shouldn't be upset, you know? Maybe I shouldn't be so down and be so negative. I should start thinking more positive because it's not changing. So that's what I wrote about. Like, I wrote about how I had to change myself for the better. Enoch, so that's you and your colleague Mm -hmm. there in action. So how do you feel about the role that you were able to play in motivating these young folks? Well, um, I know it may have seemed overwhelming, but we've we've like cherished every day and every workshop that we've got to do at our school, at Brooklyn Generation High School. And that moment, it seemed a little bit, I don't know, it was like kind of the first time I told anyone else about like I guess an issue like that I had like back in middle school. Right. So it was a little bit strange for me. So I guess I guess like stepping out of my comfort zone was a big part of me being that youth leader inside my school. And and I I hope I've got I reached some some of my peers. You've yeah. reached a lot more than just your peers. So I wanted to ask you about being approached by a filmmaker coming <laughs> to your school saying, I want to follow you around for mm-hmm. a year and really sharing some personal things. How did you find the courage to do that? Or was that even an act of courage yeah. for you? It was, well, I would say like 
the way I met Julie, the director of the CARE program came up to me and was like, come meet this woman. And I'm like, okay. So we go into this room, and Julie's sitting down at this table just excited as can be, red cheeks and just super beautiful, right? So I come and I sit down at the table, and Julie's first words to me is, um, tell me about your life. And I'm like, okay, creepy lady. The I, easy I, stuff. Right? I was like, what's your name, you know? So, so yeah, it, it, was, it, was very, it was very intense, like, the thought of being in a film, and then I really had no idea what I was getting myself into. And then Julie... And, and the whole team, they did, they did such a great job, like, making us comfortable with them. Yeah. And, like, just their presence, they became, like, our family members, in a sense. Like, they are family. Yeah. And, like, Julie was at my sister's last labor, being her doula. So she's <laughs> definitely there for me. Yeah. But, yeah, the, the whole process has been, like, just enriching, you know? So one of the things that I walked away with from the film, especially after watching you get everything in finally, <laughs> was that in so many ways, the application is a victory, regardless of what outcome comes from the school or mm -hmm. what aid package they can put together for you. For so many folks who didn't have an example, who you can't turn to your parents or even your brothers and sisters in some instance and say, mm -hmm. oh, how did this get done? that really just completing the process is a step. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And as you see in the film, for some young people, you know, just getting all of the documents that you need yeah. uh, in in order to qualify and be considered for financial aid mm -hmm. uh, can often be incredibly cumbersome, as Enoch knows. Um, and you know, we're, this is one of the things that we're hoping the film will shed light on. Like, why are we making it mm -hmm. so incredibly difficult for young people to simply apply? Like, why? Why is that? You know, it's one yeah. example I also use about you know the lack of college counselors in most public schools. Is you know, imagine we had a situation where we said, you need to know math before you graduate high school, but we're not going to fund any math teachers. Like maybe somebody at home can help you with math. Yeah. Like that's crazy. And when people see the film and then they hear about the extent to which we're not providing assistance with the college process, and once you walk through the shoes of young people who are going through it and you realize how complicated it can be, yeah. you just think this is outrageous. So it's a great film, but is there a call to action? I saw one of the young people testifying for the city council and I'm just wondering if there's a broader movement mm -hmm. or some kind of legislation mm -hmm. afoot that we should be clued into mm -hmm. before we watch mm -hmm. or as we watch the film. So locally, the yeah. Urban Youth Collaborative, which is one of the organizing groups that you see, you see their work in the film. Christine Rodriguez, who's one of the three main characters, she is an active member of the Urban new Youth school. Collaborative. Yeah. She's now at the new school. <laughs> um, so they have a Get Us to College campaign. So folks should, you know, go to their website, Urban Youth Collaborative, check out the Get Get Us to College campaign, support them and their work, get involved. Um, nationally, we're partnering with the Center for Post-Secondary Readiness and Success on awesome. the impact campaign for the film. And folks can go to our website, personalstatementfilm.com. We have an audience survey. It's really a survey to, so that you can let us know that you want to get involved, and we are going to get back in touch with you. Okay, I'm going to spoiler alert everyone again. And look mm -hmm. at you, Enoch, and ask, what do you wish you knew then that you have the benefit of knowing now? And just mm -hmm. give us an update. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your life, uh, Judy <laughs> style, just so we mm -hmm. can get out of here. I'm ready. Well, currently I transferred from SUNY Cortland to Queens College just because I feel like Queens College is a better fit for me and I'm a lot closer to home, which is super, super dope. Nice. And um, what did you say? Uh, so that's the update. Uh -huh. I just want to know what you know now that you wish oh, you would have known before. then. Yes. Like, or any sort of takeaway you want from people to see after sharing your story. Mm -hmm. Well, first I'd hope people understand that they their voice can be a voice for millions, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I really hope like people can know that they have the strength to call for a reform. And then I wish, like mm -hmm. looking at the film. Oh, yeah. I wish I visited more schools, you know? So, like, as, as you'll see in the film, I, like, visited one school, and I feel like that impacted my decision, like, tremendously. Mm -hmm. And then, like, also the fact that my sister's, like, yelling in my ear about, like, what are you doing? Do it, do it, do it. So yeah. it was pretty intense. But, yeah, that, that's, that's what I wish I did, like, just visited tons more schools. So, Julie, how can we visit your film? Tell us how folks can see it. So um, in the New York area, 
It will be on PBS on November 27th, Tuesday, November 27th at 8 p.m. on Channel 13. Very cool. And you can always go on the internets, I imagine, and look for personal yeah. statement. Yes. By Julie Dresner. Yes. And All right. There's lots of information about other ways to watch it as well at personalstatementfilm.com. Thank you totally. both for being here and sharing your story and bringing this to the light. We really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Last month, we talked about a measles outbreak that was contained to seven children in the Orthodox community in Williamsburg. But today, the NYC Department of Health reports the number of measles cases has risen to 17 and that the highly infectious disease has spread to Borough Park. While there have been no deaths, the DOH says some children have been hospitalized due to complications. If a student shows up in class with measles, all unvaccinated children, including those with a medical or religious exemption, will be excluded and unable to attend daycare or school for 21 days after their exposure the last exposure that is, if you think you were exposed to measles, the DOH recommends you call your doctor before showing up at their office to prevent spreading the disease. But most of all, make sure you and those around you are vaccinated. A New York man was arrested and charged with hate crimes Friday night after anti-Semitic messages were found in Prospect Heights at a temple, police said. James Polite is facing multiple charges, including fourth-degree criminal mischief as a hate crime and second-degree aggravated harassment as a hate crime in connection with the anti-Semitic graffiti found at Union Temple and fire set at several locations in Brooklyn just hours later. The NYPD said a janitor at a yeshiva noticed the fire and called authorities. After police apprehended Polite at the scene, he was taken to Woodhull Hospital in Brooklyn for a psychological evaluation. While Polite was at the hospital, police determined he was the same man wanted in connection with the graffiti found at Union Temple. Do you want to see if you're eligible for federal, state, and local benefits? Well, as the old saying goes, there's an app for that. And it's a good thing because every year, Americans leave nearly $80 billion in unclaimed government benefits on the table. Benefit Kitchen, a Brooklyn-based app, was launched earlier this year to assist New Yorkers in determining whether they are eligible for more than a dozen government benefits. Well, this November 6th, democracy has never been so sweet. Brooklynites who go out and vote on Tuesday can grab a 68-cent slice of famous cheesecake from Junior's Restaurant right here in America's downtown. Junior's is offering the deal to celebrate its 68th year in business, but customers have to purchase a lunch or a dinner entree to get the discount. Plus, they should, but technically don't have to, cast their ballots first. Thanks for watching, and tomorrow on 112BK, it's all about babies and politics. We'll talk to an immigration attorney and activist about birthright citizenship. And then, for National Adoption Awareness Month, we'll learn about adoption in the African-American community. We'll see you then.